Facebook Marketplace, <laughs> bad habit that. Um, but that's where this came from, weirdly enough. Uh, this is a Rolls Royce Merlin Mark 20, and uh, it was built at the Glasgow plant in early 1941. Uh, back in 2016, I did actually buy it on Facebook Marketplace. So here's the story. The story begins at the Luftfahrt Museum in Lartzen, which is on the outskirts of Hanover in Germany. Uh, I particularly like this picture. I think I should use it as one of those recapture images where you have to say how many traffic lights you can see with the added confusion of an aircraft that looks like it's about to crash. So they advertised the engine on Facebook Marketplace uh, towards the end of 2016 in around November, um, which is when I saw it. Uh, work was really busy and it was going to be necessary to go across and have a look at it. Um, and I just wasn't going to be able to do that. So I had to leave it. Um, but then to my surprise, in 2017, in around March, it was still on there, or it came back up on there. Um, at this point in time, I did have the time to go and have a look at it. Um, I've noticed a lot of people criticising it, sort of saying, oh, look, it's got a damaged engine mounting, that's never going to fly again. Um, to be honest, for the amount of money they were asking, I didn't really understand any of that logic. So we went across to Hanover, um, had a look at the engine. It's a fantastic museum. They've got an FW190, they've got a BF109 in there and many other aircraft and um, a lot of engines. Unfortunately with this engine there was no history. Um, I could see it had been a Halifax power plant but that was all. Um, it will have been recovered in Germany. I could see it had been excavated from a peat bog but that was about all, um, and I still don't know the history of it, unfortunately. The sharp-eyed amongst you might notice that it's displayed upside down. Um, I can't figure out whether that's because that's the way that it crashed, um, or because of the Germans' propensity for building all their V engines inverted like that. Um, so maybe there was a bit of humour in that, I just don't know. Um, and it wasn't until I got it back to the UK, as you can see here, that I turned it up the right way, put it on a stand, had a proper look at it. Um, here's one of the camshafts, um, and you can see where it's just been wiped over. It, it's in uh, really good condition. And then this picture shows the engine with the exhaust system, the propeller removed. And it's been like that ever since, until here in 2023, where I've now started to dismantle it. But I did restore the propeller and the propeller governor, or CSU as it's known, um, both of which were in remarkable condition. You could see from the pictures there that the wooden blades on the propeller had sheared off when the uh, aircraft came down. Um, so it was fitted with a new set of blades and I've actually been running that propeller on my own ground running Merlin 20 for about the last five years. And here's a video of it and you'll be able to see, if you look closely, the variable pitch operation of the propeller. Um, the hydraulic cylinder on the front of the prop moves in and out and pulls the blades with it via push rods. Um, and another interesting thing about that is um, there are three hydraulic seals in that propeller, only one of which has actually been replaced. The two other seals are totally original, they don't leak at all. Quite amazing. So here's the crankcase, um, which has now been cleaned up, and this engine mounting was damaged, which um, I pointed out earlier. That's now been repaired, um, and it's had one or two little bits of damage to it. Some there where the generator brackets have been ripped off the side of the engine, which meant that the holes had to be retapped. But um, otherwise, it's very clean, and. The amazing thing is that the um, environment 
in peat where this was recovered from actually protects the aluminium you don't get any corrosion on it um, you do get corrosion to the steel fasteners on the engine and obviously some of the exposed steel components but mainly just the mild steel um, the higher tensile materials that are used on it generally come out okay but it had obviously done a lot of hours um, it was clagged up with really thick black oil in the bottom end um, and I suspect it's had probably more than one overhaul on the bottom end and the cylinders will have been changed on it um, and the bottom end had done more hours than the top end of the engine because the cylinders um, and the top end of the cylinders where the camshafts are was much cleaner than the bottom half of the engine so it had certainly seen some service and it would be lovely to know the history Here's the crankshaft, which is going to be the next component to be reassembled before it goes back into the crankcase. Um, again, it's really clean. It's got some discoloration on the journals, but actually they are really good. And it doesn't really show any signs of wear, um, except for one of the main bearings, which has got ridges on it, just very, very slightly. Which tends to point towards the fact it's probably got a lot of hours on it. And also, I think this crankshaft might have been changed um, at some point during an overhaul because it doesn't actually carry the engine number, which is unusual. Here are the connecting rods, which again, are going to be the next thing to go back together. We'll assemble those onto the crankshaft um, and uh, put the bottom end of the engine back together. Really clean. If anything, I've got a bit of corrosion on the um, the top end, um, where there was a lot of burnt on carbon because of the uh, higher temperatures underneath the piston. Um, and that corrosion has actually happened as a result of that. The um, combustion products burnt onto the top of the connecting rod rather than the environment which the engine was in. Because again, it doesn't really um, particularly inside the engine, it won't really cause any corrosion. Um, even though, I mean, the engine would have had water in it. Um, four out of the 12 cylinders were actually full of water when I removed the cylinder blocks. But the engine wasn't seized and the cylinders are very clean. There's just no oxygen there to cause corrosion. And um, I believe at the same time, here's a reduction gear pinion. So those few teeth there. You can see how grubby it is, but um, <laughs> the, um, these few teeth have just been cleaned, literally. Sprayed with brake cleaner and just wiped off with a cloth. Some discoloration in the bottom of that one there. This is the lower crankcase, which you'd normally call the sump. On the Merlin, it's um, a stress member. So it's part of the complete assembly where this bolts underneath the crankcase um, and forms part of the stressed assembly. Um, so they call it the lower crankcase. They call that the upper crankcase. There's the oil pressure pump. These are the oil scavenge filters. The Merlin didn't have a full flow pressure filter. So from the pressure pump, you go straight into the main gallery feeds the crankshaft and then everything else. Um, no filter in there at all, but it's still amazing how clean these engines are. That aperture on the bottom there is where there was a drive for a hydraulic pump, which carries and powers the um, undercarriage and uh, gun turrets on bombers like this aircraft as well. Um, and this gives you an idea what the inside of the engine is like before it's been cleaned. Um, that's um, part of the front oil pickup tube you can see there. And if we go down here, there are the tops of the two scavenge filters. And this unit inside the um, sump, call it sump now, um, is a pair of oil scavenge pumps. So one of them picks up from the back, one of them picks up from the front of the engine because um, particularly being an aircraft, it could be climbing, could be descending. So it needs to pick up the oil and then return it to the tank because it's a dry sump engine. 
Um, and uh, you'll see when we come to clean this up again, you know, I mean, it's going to be really clean. Um, lots of grit and stuff in there, but actually, probably not even grit. It's probably um, because it's not that kind of uh, ground that this thing was recovered from. Um, possibly even some stuff has got in there since it's been dismantled. So um, I'm going to clean all this up. The pumps don't turn at the moment, they're actually seized. Um, but again, interestingly, it won't be seized due to corrosion. Um, possibly just seized due to dried oil. Um, so the first part of the project is going to be to assemble the crankshaft, put it back in here, overhaul this, and then fit that back to the, um, the bottom of the crankcase. And then everything else really can just be added on as I go along. So I can do one component at a time. So here's the uh, B-side cylinder bank. And just exactly as it was removed, and you can see this stuff is just peat, which has gone in with water and then dried up in here. And it's exactly the same stuff you put on your garden, if you watch. Okay, that's literally all it is. Um, and it doesn't cause any, as I mentioned, um, corrosion to the aluminium. Um, the inside of the top end of the engine was very clean, relatively. <laughs> Um, and I suspect the engine has had a block change um, <clears throat> at some period in time um, since the rest of the engine was overhauled. This here is just one of the worst pieces of damage it's really got. So um, I suspect the engine went in upside down um, and there's more damage to the top end of the engine than the bottom. But this is easily weldable. so. There's no actual problem with that repair. Um, this is the induction manifold. And if you look through that gap there, that's looking into the ports of the engine. We can't actually see through there because it's got a flame trap. So um, it's a series of metal foils that are very close together. And if the compressed mixture in this induction system here because it's a supercharged engine and it's pumping a mixture of uh, fuel and air right the way through the induction system under pressure is subject to a spark um, or a flame coming back out through one of these inlet valves and the whole lot will ignite um, and it did used to happen from time to time um, even actually even after these flame traps were fitted it could still happen but they alleviated most of the problems with that. Um, this is one of the priming jets because again because the carburetor is so far away from the cylinders you need to inject fuel um, into the intake manifolds just to get the engine to fire. So there are four of these on the engine. There's the other cylinder bank. And it'll be a while, obviously a long time before I get on to overhauling these but uh, when I do I'll video it and then Eventually, we'll see the engine run. So, just to run around a few more of the parts of here, this is um, the wheel case, which will be the first component that goes on the back of the crankcase there. This drives everything on the engine, including feeding this supercharger drive, which has the uh, high and low speed clutches on it. There's the reduction gear casing, which will be the first part to go back onto the front of the engine. Um, and the shaft which goes in it. You can see where it's probably had water sitting in it I suspect. Could be water, it could just be the oil because the engine was stored inverted, it displayed inverted. Here's the supercharger and again it's got a bit of damage to the control shaft there, you can see where that's bent. So that's replaced with a new piece of three quarter inch tube. Um, it's caused this bracket to break off at the end here. But again, I mean, the, the material is highly weldable, um, no problem at all. This unit is the boost control, which limits the maximum boost and also keeps it at a constant when the aircraft's climbing, for example. Um, that's also got some damage to it. That might be a bit more of a problem. Um, might have to try and find another one. Um, but again, really, these are the worst things that are wrong with the engine. Um, the supercharger itself is undamaged and uh, in really good condition. 
And here's one of the connecting rods again, um, up against, just as a comparison, up against the con rod from a Paxman V8 diesel engine, um, which was about 101 litres capacity. So you think the Merlin parts are big compared to a car engine, and then you look at something like that and realise, well, actually, they're not. <laughs> Incidentally, the Paxman uses the same fork and blade connecting rod arrangement as the Merlin. Almost identical. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this introduction and if you want to follow this project as it goes along feel free to subscribe to this channel or look out for updates.